Hello and welcome to Like Maria. Today I'm going to be talking about film documentary and thinking specifically about what it is and where it's come from. So we might think that film documentaries aren't very popular. If you look at the cinema, you're very unlikely to find a film documentary on one of the big screens. And even if you did, chances are that's not the film you went to see. However, if we look at streaming services like Netflix or Now TV, we'll see that documentaries form quite a lot of the content. And shocking documentaries often provide the water cooler moment and give us something to talk about. Documentaries have a long film history. In fact, some of the earliest films were considered documentaries or actualities. And if you think about it, the infrastructure wasn't in place for kind of fictional films anyway. So early filmmakers like the Lumiere brothers had to rely on real people and real events, which of course is what we expect from our film documentaries today, which is where some of the problems arise because if a director uses too many reconstructions, and they're not obviously reconstructions, we can be fooled into thinking that those are real people rather than actors. And some directors may well stage certain scenes or direct the participants far too much rather than just observe. A very early film by the Lumiere brothers called Workers Leaving the Factory shows a group of workers leaving the factory at the end of the day. But if we look at the images more closely, we can see everyone's really well dressed. This is probably not their work attire. And everyone is deliberately avoiding looking at the camera. Um, so there's definitely a sense that this has been staged in some way that the, um, that the people have been given some sort of direction. Another very early film um, recorded with um, Edison's kinetoscope was Fred Ott's Sneeze and um, we could argue maybe that this is an actuality that it's capturing a real moment but if we think about how difficult it would be to film a sneeze this moment must be staged. So even from this very early age in film history questions about documentaries and their authenticity have existed and this is one of the key arguments to do with documentary how real are they? Lots of you will be studying John Grierson and looking at his approach and philosophies towards documentary making. But before he started making documentaries, he was hugely influenced by the work of Robert Flaherty and in particular a documentary called Nanook of the North. Now Flaherty spent over a year um, filming Eskimos and made friends with an Eskimo family and tried to show what their struggles were like and what their everyday life was like. This documentary is hugely criticised for being a really romanticised look at life. And in particular, Flaherty doesn't just observe. Um, apparently, the Eskimo family weren't actually related to each other. They had been cast so that they looked like a family. Um, Flaherty rehearsed and recreated particular events. And he tried to weave a sort of poetic feeling um, through the documentary. So the reason why I mention this is because we could argue that this is the influence for Grierson's very famous quote that documentary is the creative treatment of actuality. This is one of the first times where we see creativity and observation being combined. So Grierson really did see the potential of documentary as a tool to educate the masses and mixed visual images with other art forms like poetry in order to create particular messages. Now we could argue that this is possibly propaganda and certainly if we look at documentary history, Hitler recognised the power of the documentary as propaganda. A very famous documentary being Triumph of the Will which had people looking at the Nazi party with admiration. But not everyone took this approach to documentary making throughout history. And there was a whole movement in the sort of 50s and 60s that D.A. Pennybaker belonged to called direct cinema, sometimes also known as cinema verite or the observational mode. Pioneers of the direct cinema movement believed that it was really important that they didn't interfere with the subject matter and the information that they were filming. Their job was purely to observe. This was made easier through lighter, more portable cameras and the fact that they chose to record people that were already used to being in the spotlight. So politicians, musicians often featured in their documentaries. So I mentioned that direct cinema is also sometimes referred to as the observational mode, but there are six different documentary modes identified by Bill Nichols in his book Introduction to Documentary. 
So the observational mode, as I've mentioned, is about observing real life without interrupting it, trying to make it as natural as possible. The expository mode are documentaries that um, try to reveal something, that give a specific point of view or create a specific argument. The poetic mode is almost the complete opposite to that. It's documentaries that focus on a mood, and tone, a feeling rather than a clear story. We also have the reflexive mode and often those types of documentaries focus on the relationship between the filmmaker and the audience. Um, the audience is encouraged to think about the documentary making and the information that's being presented. So it's quite an active spectator. And then we also have the performative mode, which is where the filmmaker appears on the screen and they talk to us about their experience of making the documentary. And then the participatory mode, and this is where the filmmaker and the subject interact. So we see them asking questions um, and we see how they develop the interview. And in recent years, things like the performative mode and the participatory mode have become more popular. And perhaps those are the more interesting modes because of what the filmmakers tend to do. I personally would argue that the performative mode and the participatory mode are the most honest documentaries, are the most truthful documentaries because the filmmaker doesn't hide behind the camera. They appear on screen and they make their opinions known. Now, all of this discussion of the creative treatment of actuality and manipulating the truth and hiding behind the camera assumes that the audience isn't very sophisticated when they're watching documentaries and this really isn't the case. The audience approach documentary differently to a fiction film. If you think about it, when we go to the cinema, we are often got our popcorn and we want to be entertained. With a documentary, it's a completely different experience. When we sit down to watch it, we're expecting to learn something. So according to Annette Hill in the documentary film book, audiences engage with documentaries in different ways. So first of all, cognitive engagement, and that's where they're thinking about how the documentary is constructed. They also might have a psychological engagement, and that's thinking about the people on screen. Then the self-reflexive engagement is thinking about themselves as an audience member and relating that to what's going on on screen. So psychological engagement and self-reflexive engagement might go hand in hand. They might have a sensory engagement, so that might be to do with particular sounds and smells. They might have a particularly physical response, so they might feel sick or they might feel you know, scared of something, depending on what the documentary is about. And they may have emotional engagement, so they might feel an emotional connection to a person or an event that happens or something like that. Ultimately, what Annette Hill says is that audiences um, approach documentaries in a default critical mode. So going back to that idea of us approaching documentaries thinking that we're going to learn something, we're also a little bit sceptical about what we see and we question how true to life the documentary might be. So we thought a bit about the history of documentary, we thought about modes of documentary and we thought about the audience response to documentary. But I'm not sure we've actually answered the question of what is documentary. And it is a form that's changed a lot over time. Um, if you think about television documentaries, we have all sorts on there and we have a lot of hybridity in terms of docudramas and scripted reality and things like that. So it can be quite difficult to pinpoint but ultimately, a documentary might reflect the past, it might be set in the present, it might speculate on the future, but ultimately it will make a point about something, it will try and enlighten us on a particular topic. It may have specific technical features such as the use of handheld camera, the use of synchronised sound, the use of ambient lighting, and obviously everything is meant to seem very natural, so um, lack of attention to mise-en-scene, although some documentary makers are known for wearing specific clothes, um, almost like a costume, to create a particular persona. Documentaries have become cheaper to produce in um, recent years, partly because of digital filmmaking equipment. Digital editing makes it much easier and quicker to edit things. Um, and there's lots of potential for distribution as well. So you might show your documentary on YouTube, 
Um, there's all those streaming services and so on, um, which means that more documentary content can be made and um, distributed to the audience. Documentaries tend to use archive images. They might use newsreel footage. They might use interviews or talking heads. Often they'll seek an opinion from an expert. Sometimes we have voiceover in documentaries and often that is a male voice, um, a voice of authority or the voice of God it's sometimes called. Documentaries might use graphics such as charts and maps to show information and as I've already mentioned quite a lot they might use reconstructions if um, they're unable to get actual footage of certain events. What we might not associate with documentary is traditional sort of storytelling techniques and narrative but if you think about it documentaries are full of binary oppositions good and evil different types of characters and we follow particular stories um, all the way through so there are plenty of similarities with a fiction film finally a documentary will try to reach some sort of conclusion and it may have persuaded the audience of a particular viewpoint ultimately a documentary will leave us thinking about what we've seen. So I hope you found out a bit more about documentaries today. I have got a written handout on our website if you'd like something to read through about documentary. But thanks for watching and see you again soon. Bye bye. <music>